Your husband refused to do as he was told. All he had to do was write what I wanted him to write. Don't you see? Together we can create something absolutely wonderful. You're gonna bring about something glorious and terrible once we get you some proper editorial control. All well-written stories are crafted with intention. As discussed in Lesson 1, Logos, or rational intent, is required when crafting a work of art in any form. So when experiencing a film, book, or video game, I attempt to sleuth out what the author's intention is. Granted, the intention of any writer is to provide entertainment for others. But simple entertainment without an underlying purpose generally falls flat. Think of how many stories have been written since the invention of the oral tradition or the written word. Out of the millions of books written, how many from over a millennia ago do we still read to this day? Not very many. This is because stories without a lasting relevance to the human condition, while entertaining, tend to be forgotten with time. It is the story that speaks to our souls that stay with us. With this in mind, the best stories are the ones that bear an underlying message, a uniform theme that can be witnessed throughout the work. On occasion, these themes can be accidental, but in general, the themes with the narrative are a direct reflection of the artist's logos while creating it. Before proceeding, I want to clarify that I will not be using the term logos in the classic literary sense. In literature, there are three types of methods the story uses to convince the reader of their rhetoric. This is ethos, the use of ethics, pathos, the use of emotion, and logos, the use of logic. Throughout this video, I will be using the term logos in the abstract sense. It is from the root logoi referring to the cosmic intention behind a creation. Without that intention, the creation has no meaning. For Alan, his logos is fairly basic when writing Departure. His intention is to free Alice from the dark place. Thomas Zane had the same intention when attempting to write Barbara back. My personal logos for this video is to explain why Alan succeeded and Zane failed. This will be answered by the end, but for now, let's look at the most prevalent theme within Alan Wake. What does Dr. Hartman and the Dark Presence have in common? Both serve the same thematic purpose in the story. As neither of them have the ability to create anything themselves, their aim is to be the editor for others who are capable of creation. In essence, their role in the narrative is to subvert the intention of Alan and replace it with their own logos, their own agenda. Dr. Hartman's name by itself tells us everything we need to know about him. Emil is based upon the Latin root emelos, which means striving to equal, or if used as a verb, to be an imitation or to emulate. His surname phonetically sounds like Artman. In a literal sense, his name means the imitation of art. Being a place of power, Cauldron Lake takes the works of art created within its vicinity and makes them real. This effectively allows the logos of the creator to be made real as well. While we are never told specifically what he wants, Dr. Hartman desperately desires to use the lake to reshape the world in his image. In his mind, only his logos would create the perfect world. However, he is not an artist, and is therefore incapable of using its power. The only solution is to become the editor of artists who are capable of creation. Once before, he managed to influence a writer, and the results are the direct cause of all the events in the game. After Barbara's death, Thomas and Emile understood what the lake could do, so Emile convinced Zane to use its power to bring her back. It exhilarated him, but there was fear too. If not for his young assistant Emile, he would have given it up. But Emile convinced him otherwise. He too went away with words. This resulted in the Dark Presence slipping through, wearing Jagger's skin as a disguise. Immediately, the Dark Presence sunk its claws into Zane, pretending to be his muse. Its intention, however, was not to inspire art, but to make sure the logos of anything Zane writes from there on forward would be to fully release it from the Dark Place. Later, after Alice is dragged into the lake, the Dark Presence attempted the exact same form of editorial control with Alan. While Alan's logos was to free Alice, Jagger's logos was to free itself. Weak even comments on this. But it seems I have an imaginary editor to help me. She's an old woman in a funeral dress. I call her Barbara Jagger. She's very strict. 
I'm writing faster and faster. My manuscript is being heavily revised. The edits are getting very aggressive, and each day there's less of me and more of her. In the end, the reoccurring theme throughout Alan Wake is using literature to push an agenda. Whether that agenda is a perceived benevolence in Dr. Hartman's case, or a selfish agenda that leads to destruction in the case of the Dark Presence, the role in the story is effectively the same. So why did Alan succeed and Thomas fail? To answer that, let's use nature as a metaphor. All ecosystems consist of various moving parts. The animal life, plants, insects, fungi, and weather, they are all interrelated. When all of these aspects are in balance with one another, it is called ecological homeostasis. Now things can disrupt this homeostasis, such as a storm, fire, drought, etc. If the ecosystem is altered, the balance is shifted. For a temporary change like a storm, generally the ecosystem will settle back to its previous state once the event has passed. However, if there is a permanent change, such as a new predator moving in, the entire ecosystem will have to change before settling back down to balance itself. Much like an ecosystem, the story functions the same way. The setting, characters, the themes, and plot, they all interrelate and have a literary homeostasis with one another. Unlike an ecosystem, however, this settling to find balance is not a natural process. If a change is made, the author has to consciously modify the entire story to accommodate that alteration. If a character or event do not fit into the logic of the story, we say the event is contrived. That is to say, it is an unnatural occurrence within the story. Alan states, A story is not a machine that does what you tell it. A story is a beast with a life of its own. You can create it, shape it, but as the story grows, it starts wanting things of its own. Change one thing and you set off a chain reaction of events that spreads through the whole thing. The characters have to be true to themselves. The events need to follow a logic that fits the story. A single flaw and the magic is gone. The story dies. Alice dies. When an author's personal agenda for a story disregards a logical narrative, the events and characters begin to feel contrived. This is where Thomas went wrong and Alan succeeded. In Zane's case, he wanted Barbara back and disregarded writing a story that logically fulfilled that desire. He wanted something for nothing and his story by extension was contrived and unbalanced. Unlike with real fiction that obey only the author's will, the power of Cauldron Lake, much like nature, demands homeostasis. Barbara was revived, but if a light was to re-enter the world, darkness would tag along to level out the scales. It appears that after convincing Zane to write this, and it going horribly wrong, Dr. Hartman never learned. To this day, he is trying to manipulate his story. The experience Thomas Zane had parallels the short story by William Weimark Jacobs entitled The Monkey's Paw. Within it, the White family comes into possession of an enchanted paw that grants three wishes. Initially, Mr. White wishes for enough money to pay off his mortgage. The next day, his son died in a factory accident, and the settlement was for the exact sum of money that he wished for. At the funeral, he is pressured by his wife to resurrect their son. Later that evening, the rotting corpse of Herbert White knocks on the door after crawling from his grave and walking to the home. Fearing what he had done, he uses the last wish to send him back to the grave. The lesson Thomas and Mr. White learned was there must always be a price for messing with fate. Wishing for money doesn't mean it magically appears in your pocket. It must come from somewhere. If that process isn't detailed in the story, Cauldron Lake will fill in the blanks. By the time Alan wrote the ending to Departure, he had learned this lesson. In order to rescue Alice, he had to give a sacrifice so the scales stayed balanced. A light for a light, darkness for darkness. When reading a story, it is important to remember there are generally two voices speaking to the audience, the author and the editor. One patient at the lodge, Emerson, has some strong opinions on the relationship between the two. My nightmare is the publisher people who want to make a contribution so they can say they made a contribution. And then we end up with mullets in there because they think mullets are funny, but it wasn't supposed to be about mullets. And now it's about mullets. And when it's in slow motion, they call it mullet time because the numbers came back from marketing that mullet time is the hook we needed to go big in the target demographic. And they're not even kidding. They say it all like serial killers with straight face 
faces and smiles. And I have to listen to them because they're not scared of me. And everyone should just shut up. Shut up. Shut up. But I don't see nightmares anymore because I'm too scary for them. I take two pills every morning and one with every meal and four when I go to bed. And that makes me the scariest nightmare of all. He felt as though the editors usurped control of his creation from him. This became his nightmare. So he crafted himself into a nightmare himself to feel as though he had full control of his story. The reoccurring theme of the editor taking control of a creation is on full display here. To conclude, let us recap the creative process. The author has an idea or mode of thinking about the world. The logos, when writing the story, is the intention to convey that idea to the audience. The story itself is the rhetoric used to pass along that message. When all events of the story fit within its own logic, the narrative has literary homeostasis. When an occurrence within the narrative does not fit into the logic of the story, that event is contrived. This is usually a smoke signal showing off the author's agenda. So I want to give out a challenge. The next time you're watching a film or reading a book, try to determine what the message of the narrative is. Did it get conveyed within the logic of the story, or was it contrived? And most importantly, do you agree with the message or not?